Hi, this is Dr. Joshua Cooper, and we're going to be discussing intracardiac electrograms. It's critically important for all electrophysiologists to understand in detail how unipolar and bipolar signals are recorded and how they should be interpreted in order to maximize the safety and success of EP studies and catheter ablation procedures. First, I wanted to briefly distinguish between surface electrocardiogram recording and intracardiac electrogram recording. When we're recording a surface electrocardiogram, you have two electrodes, the anode and cathode, that are placed on the skin surface, both far away from the heart itself. The field of view of those electrodes and the distance between them is the entire heart, so that you, in fact, will record the surface P wave, all of the atrial activity, the surface QRS complex, all of the ventricular depolarization, and also even the T wave, the repolarization of ventricular tissue. However, when you place a catheter inside the heart with very closely spaced electrodes so that your anode and cathode are only two or three millimeters apart, the field of view is much, much smaller. So instead of seeing atrial and ventricular activity in their entirety, you're only going to see a little sliver of the local myocardial activation right at the location of where the bipole is positioned. This recording is now known as an electrogram. And in this case, with the catheter in the right ventricle, you're not going to see any appreciable atrial activity and you're not even going to see ventricular activity that falls before or after this local recording, again called an electrogram. Let's start by discussing unipolar recordings in the heart. But before we start, you might be asking yourself, wait a minute, we just discussed having an anode and a cathode in the recording circuit, so what do you mean by unipolar recording where there's only one electrode? And here's what we mean when we say unipolar recording in the heart. What we're talking about is actually having only one electrode in the heart itself, that usually being an anode, and the cathode is somewhere remote, not located in the heart. And there are two ways of accomplishing that. One is to take advantage of the surface electrocardiogram electrodes that are already stuck to the patient's skin. If you use the right arm, left arm, and left leg electrodes, they form a triangle, and those vectors actually cancel each other out. If you electrically couple all three and use them as the recording cathode, you're basically going to be recording a unipolar electrogram from the catheter inside the heart. Because there is electrical artifact introduced at the level of the adhesive between the electrode and the skin, if you were to add 5,000 to 50,000 ohm resistors into those recording surface electrodes, you actually can greatly reduce the amount of that artifact. This is known as, you, as Wilson Central Terminal. That means using the surface EKG for creating a unipolar recording. The other way that you can achieve a unipolar recording is to place one electrode in the heart like before but have a second electrode in the body itself, but remote from the heart. And this is most often accomplished by having either an independent catheter positioned in the inferior vena cava or an intracardiac catheter that has an additional electrode mounted somewhere low down in the inferior vena cava that is remote from the heart. And that can serve as the recording cathode. And if that is hooked into your recording system, again, you can record a unipolar recording, and that electrode is known as the indifferent electrode. So here's how we would take a unipolar recording with the anode being shown, the red bar representing a sheet of myocardium, and the wavefront moving here from left to right past the electrode and beyond. What's important to recognize in this recording are several things. Number one, when the, uh, the wavefront is far away from the electrode at the beginning and at the end of this recording, it is outside of the field of view, and therefore the electrode will record nothing because it can't see it. It is only when the wavefront gets close enough to the electrode that it will start to take a recording. And when the wavefront is moving toward 
the electrode, you're going to see a positive deflection reflecting the movement toward the recording electrode. When the wavefront passes underneath the electrode and starts to move away, you have a rapid change in the polarity of the electrogram, and now it is negative because the wavefront is moving away until it is completely out of view, in which case there's now no longer a recording. If in this same slab of myocardium, you position the electrode at the very dead end of the tissue, this is what the recording will look like with the wavefront again moving from left to right. You're going to have a much longer period where the wavefront is out of the field of view of that one recording electrode. You're going to have a positive deflection as the wavefront moves toward and to underneath the electrode. But because the wavefront at no point is moving away from the electrode, there's no negative deflection seen. And conversely, if you place the electrode at the very beginning of this strip where the signal starts, you're going to see the opposite, where at the beginning of the recording, you're going to see a negative deflection because the wavefront is moving away from the recording electrode until it gets out of view far enough away and then there will be a flat or absent recording. Similarly, if the unipolar electrode is positioned in the middle of the myocardial tissue and the wavefront originates immediately underneath this electrode traveling in more than one direction, you will only see a negative deflection in the unipolar recording because wavefronts are only moving away from the recording electrode and never toward it. You can take advantage of this fact when using a catheter to map the origin of a focal arrhythmia when you are at the site of origin, you will only see a negative deflection and no positive deflection in the unipolar electrogram. For example, here is a recording taken when a PVC is being mapped in the right ventricular outflow tract. You can see in the top six recordings here, the surface EKGs in those leads. And you can see in the distal electrode of the mapping catheter, which is also going to serve as the ablation catheter, you can see in this site A location, there's an initial positive deflection in this unipolar recording. That suggests that the wavefront from the origin is moving toward the electrode at some point at the beginning, and therefore the electrode cannot possibly be located immediately over that origin, and you're not at the right place for ablation. If you move the catheter to site B and you see this type of recording where there is absolutely no positive deflection but only a negative deflection, that's very encouraging that the wavefront is only moving away from your electrode and suggests the possibility that you may be located right adjacent to or right over the origin. The one caveat, of course, is that if there is an isoelectric initial component to the unipolar recording, then it's possible that that downstroke is not the actual start of the electrogram. And so you have to combine this information with bipolar timing to be 100% certain that your electrode is at the site of origin. But when you see this sharp downward deflection, it is very suggestive that you may be on the right track or even at the correct site. Now we're going to move on from unipolar recordings to bipolar recordings. As a reminder, a normal unipolar recording is taken with an anode against myocardial tissue. And as shown in this picture, if a wavefront is moving toward the anode, a positive deflection is generated in the unipolar recording, followed by a rapid downstroke as the wavefront passes the electrode, and a negative deflection as the wavefront recedes until it's beyond the field of view and then no recording is made. What if you took a unipolar recording, but used a cathode, the opposite polarity from what we were just showing, and again had a wavefront move from left to right? Well, basically you're going to see a complete opposite of the recording we showed before. When the, elect when the electrode is recording the signal coming toward it, it's going to show a negative deflection instead of positive. And then there's going to be a rapid transition to a positive deflection as the wavefront moves away. And this opposite polarity 
is a reflection of the opposite nature of the electrode being used to record. Why is that important? Because if you were to record simultaneously an anode and a cathode in unipolar fashion and combine the two, that is how we get bipolar recordings. So let's do this step by step. If we have these two electrodes positioned near each other, but not exactly on top of each other, and a wavefront moves from left to right, you're going to record both of the things I showed before. The anode is going to record a positive deflection, and then a negative deflection as the wavefront approaches, passes, and then recedes from that electrode. And the cathode is going to show the opposite, but a little later because it's positioned a little downstream with regard to wavefront propagation. If you were to take these two recordings and couple them together, into one channel, you now have a bipolar recording. And what's the bipolar recording going to look like? It's basically going to be a fusion of the two unipolar recordings superimposed in the one channel. And it will look like this. In a location where you had only a positive deflection in one electrode and nothing in the other, it's going to balance out as a positive deflection at the beginning of the recording and similarly at the end. And in the middle, you're going to see a fusion of the two where there's overlap and either nullification or amplification depending on the polarities and the timing. If you were to take those two electrodes and move them closer together, then you're going to get a different appearance of the bipolar recording. Here is an example of the two electrodes being positioned very close together. And this is what the recording will look like as a consequence. The amplitude is going to be smaller and the timing is going to be more precise because the electrogram is going to be sharper. Essentially, what is being recorded is the wavefront moving in between the two electrodes because they're so close together in terms of timing that most of the overlap here is going to cancel each other out, except for the little phase shift in the middle. So you get very, very precise electrical timing information when you have a closely spaced bipole, but the amplitude is going to shrink. So there's a balance in terms of how closely spaced electrodes should be in terms of giving you accurate timing information, but being able to see the electrogram clearly. If you think about this now in different dimensions, when you have a bipole, you can have a wavefront that passes in a direction that is parallel to the electrodes, in which case you'll get a recording in exactly the way I showed. But what if the wavefront moves perpendicularly to the orientation of the bipole? You're actually going to get a very flat or almost absent recording because in this case, the two opposite polarity electrodes are going to be recording the signal at exactly the same time because the geometry is the same between the two rather than seeing the wavefront sequentially, in which case you're going to get almost complete nullification and overlap of the opposite polarity of the two unipolar recordings. In reality, when you have a catheter inside the heart, usually both electrodes are not exactly lying against the tissue the tip electrode is usually against tissue and the next electrode is usually floating in the blood pool. And so you're not usually going to get an exact perpendicular orientation of a wavefront compared to your bipole, but you need to take this into account when you're thinking about bipolar recordings. Let's start talking about how to interpret bipolar electrograms with regard to timing and shape. It is first important to recognize that when we are taking intracardiac electrograms, we are attempting to record very small signals from myocardial tissue. But the patient during the study is located in an electrophysiology laboratory where there are all sorts of other electrical signals in the environment and those signals can obscure our ability to see the signals of interest. 
For example, there can be high frequency signals that come from the electrical equipment immediately surrounding the patient, creating an artifact or noise uh, that is of high frequency. And for this reason, we have something called a low pass filter that can eliminate these high frequency signals. And the way to remember this is a low pass filter will pass the low frequency signals, but remove the high frequency signals. So in this case, if we apply a low pass filter to eliminate the electrical noise shown in the diagram, it will clean up the signal and you can see the myocardial potentials more clearly. Conversely, there can be low frequency electrical signals generated around the patient as well. Typically, these low frequency signals come from movement of the wires and breathing of the patient that can create an undulation in the baseline. This low frequency noise also can obscure the signals of interest. And for this purpose, we have a high pass filter, which as the name suggests, will give a pass or allow through the higher frequency signals and it will eliminate the low frequency signals. And usually in this case, for an intracardiac bipolar electrogram, it will be set at about 30 hertz. And this drifty signal that you see in this diagram can be again cleaned up, showing much more clearly the signal of interest and eliminating the low frequency noise. When we're thinking about bipolar electrograms, we're really thinking about precise timing, as I mentioned in an earlier talk. For example, if we go back to the PVC analogy, here is a recording of a PVC with the top six lines showing surface electrocardiogram tracings in these leads. And we're recording from the ablation catheter tip a bipolar electrogram. And in this case, the shape of the signal is not giving the same meaning as the unipolar signal did, but the timing information is what we're after. If you look at the first sharp deflection and see how it compares to the start of the surface PVC, we can figure out how early we are with our catheter tip compared to the onset of the PVC beat. In this case, at site A, we're 20 milliseconds in front. If we move the catheter to another site and show that this bipolar sharp deflection is even earlier at minus 35 milliseconds, we can assume correctly that we are closer to the site of origin of the PVC. And by going point by point and creating an activation map, a timing map of all these bipolar signals, we can get very precise location and timing information in seeking out the origin for the purposes of ablation of this PVC. But again, if you look at the morphology of the bipolar electrogram, that's not giving us very much information the way the unipolar signals did. These both are just rapid sharp deflections and the polarity, positive or negative, doesn't really tell us anything about direction of the wavefront. It's really the timing that's critical with bipolar recordings. I wanted to show a couple examples, though, of how bipolar signals may look in different myocardial scenarios. In the simplest situation, if a wavefront passes across normal myocardium unobstructed, and an ablation catheter is placed with a distal bipole adjacent to myocardial tissue, you'll generate a relatively simple bipolar electrogram as shown. However, if you have an area of myocardial scar, and remember, of course, that myocardial scar is not simply dead tissue, but it is an intermingling of live but sick and slowly conducting myocardial fibers adjacent to true fibrosis and scar that serves as an electrical barrier. And now a wavefront approaches this area, you're going to get all kinds of wavefronts moving at various times in various directions in a small geographic location. If a bipole is placed now on this tissue, it's going to record in its field of view all these little signals that are happening at different points in time 
traveling in different directions, and it's going to generate a fractionated, prolonged signal, usually of low amplitude because it's not a large mass of myocardium that's being activated with each of these small little fibers. We get excited when we are mapping, for example, reentrant ventricular tachycardia, when we see fractionated signals. And similarly, if we're looking at a diseased atrium with lots of scar, and the reason we get excited is the same physiology that creates a fractionated signal during sinus rhythm can allow for a reentry circuit to occur within this area of scar. The fractionated signal suggests the possibility that this area may be participating in the mechanism of a reentrant arrhythmia in the atrium or the ventricle. If you have normal myocardium, but there is a single electrical barrier such that an oncoming wavefront meets it. In order to activate the myocardium on the opposite side of the barrier, the wavefront must travel along the barrier, go around to get to the other side. If a mapping catheter is positioned right on that barrier, such that its field of view includes myocardial tissue on both sides, then when a bipolar electrogram is recorded, it's going to see two signals. It's going to see the first signal as the wavefront first approaches the barrier on the first side, that's shown here as the first signal in the recording. But then as the wavefront travels around the barrier and then comes back in the field of view on the other side of the barrier, you're going to get a second signal. This is known as a split potential or a double potential, and when it is seen, it suggests that there is a line of electrical block upon which the mapping catheter is positioned. That block could be native from native scar, or it could be man-made because of an ablation line that had been created. Let's delve a little further into the shape of bipolar electrograms and review the few scenarios where bipolar electrogram morphology can actually be of clinical use. Here we have a patient who has scar-related ventricular tachycardia. And in this recording, there is ventricular pacing going on through the strip. You can see the pacing artifact before each QRS complex and the complexes marching through at the pacing rate. If you look at the bipolar recording from the ablation catheter tip, you're going to notice that there are in fact two components associated with each beat. And your first instinct might be to think that one is a ventricular signal and the other is an atrial signal until you look at the coronary sinus catheter recording showing slower atrial signals marching through the recording. This suggests that both of the elements of the ablation catheter recording are ventricular. And the reason that there is a wide spaced double potential is that the catheter is positioned on a line of electrical block. This could be either from native scar or from previous catheter ablation generating iatrogenic scar. Either way, there is a line of electrical block, and this fact can be useful when trying to figure out the ventricular tachycardia circuit and designing an ablation strategy. Another way that the morphology of a bipolar electrogram can be useful is during energy application. Here is an example of an atrial flutter ablation and the energy is turned on for an ablation lesion. And you can see at the start of the strip, there is a nice, simple bipolar electrogram. But soon into radiofrequency energy application, the electrogram starts to become more rounded, more low frequency. And even several seconds into the ablation lesion, it has a very different shape than before ablation commenced. This is one way to assess efficacy of ablation lesion formation. When the bipolar signal starts to disappear and become very uh, far field looking, which I'll explain in a, in a few slides, or lower frequency, 
that can tell you that there has been successful destruction of myocardial tissue and you might choose to come off energy application sooner than the timer has been set. Another piece of information that can be useful during energy application is to look at the morphology of the electrogram. Here again is atrial flutter being ablated. And notice in this case that the electrogram, which is probably overlapping with a previous radiofrequency lesion, starts as a single signal. And by the end, a few seconds later, you start to see the beginnings of a double potential. And as I explained in the previous segment, when you see a double potential, that suggests a line of block is forming or present. This can give you a forecast that you are successfully generating a line of block on the cavotricuspid isthmus during flutter ablation. And it can serve also to guide you if there is a gap in the line where further ablation needs to be performed. The wider the double potential along the line, the more it suggests block is present at that location. So you'd search for a single bipolar signal potential instead of a wide space double if you're looking for a gap in the line. While the bipolar electrogram shape does not tell you about the direction of a wavefront, if a bipolar electrogram changes its shape, it does tell you that there is a wavefront coming from a different direction, even though you may not know what that direction is. So this is yet another case of flutter ablation, but done during atrial pacing from the coronary sinus. And in this case, there was a lot of delay along the isthmus line being created, but it was unclear at which point block actually occurred. The timing between the signal shown here and the signal shown here is rather subtle, but the morphology is not. The fact that this electrogram starts as a positive and ends as a negative, and there is a reversal of that pattern in this bipolar electrogram, tells us that the wavefront is approaching that bipole from a different direction. In this case, coming from the lateral part of the low right atrium rather than through the medial part and across the leaky line. It is on this second beat that electrical block was finally achieved, and other than the bipolar timing clue, which was subtle, the morphology change in the bipolar electrogram was further confirmation that electrical block was finally achieved in this complicated flutter case. Another morphology characteristic that is important to appreciate in bipolar recordings is whether a signal is sharp or blunt. When a wavefront passes immediately adjacent to a recording bipole, a very high frequency sharp signal is generated known as near field. Whereas if the wavefront is passing a little bit further away, but not totally out of the field of view of the bipole, then a blunt or low frequency signal is recorded known as far field. Here's an example where that distinction was critical. This was a PVC ablation case, and you can see the surface EKG leads up top. And here is a bipolar recording from the distal poles of the mapping catheter. I'm going to expand the electrogram so that we can see it more clearly. Notice that there is a very early signal seen, the timing of which was very enticing. But the nature of the signal was that it was somewhat blunt, suggesting that this was far field and not immediately adjacent to the mapping catheter bipole. The second component of the signal was very sharp, suggesting this was the local potential, but it wasn't very early. As the mapping catheter was moved around the endocardial surface in this area, at no point was there able to be a sharp electrogram recorded at that early time where the blunt signal is currently seen. That suggested the possibility that this signal was coming from deeper in the myocardium or even on the epicardial surface. As a consequence, the catheter was advanced out the coronary sinus to the great cardiac vein location so that signals on the epicardial surface of the heart could be sampled and recorded. And here is what we found immediately opposite the endocardial site shown on the left. Now on the right, 
within the venous structures on the outer surface of the heart, there was a very sharp and very early signal that timed exactly with this blunt signal that was seen on the opposite side of the myocardium. This suggests a local potential because it is sharp or near field, and the timing is wonderful with regard to potentially finding the origin of the PVC. Notice that the second component is a little more blunt as this site on the epicardium is seeing the endocardial signal in a little bit of a far field manner. By looking at the difference between blunt and sharp signals, one could fine tune the mapping location for where the origin of this PVC might be. Now it's time to put it all together. Let's review how unipolar and bipolar electrogram information is complementary and ideally both types of recordings should be used at each recording site to give you the most information about local activation time and what's going on in the tissue that surrounds it. It's important to first consider the nature of the catheter that's being used to map. Here is a traditional mapping catheter, which is also serving as an ablation catheter. And these typically have four electrodes grouped in two bipoles. And we often think only about the distal and the proximal bipolar recordings. But remember, of course, that there are a total of four electrodes and each one of these, numbered one through four from the tip as per convention, can provide a unipolar recording as well. So that from the distal pair, you can record two unipolar signals. We talked before about how each bipole will give you a near field range of sharp electrograms telling you about local activation time, and also that there is an extended field of view in its full recording range where each bipole will give you far field signals telling you a little bit of information about what's going on in the tissue that surrounds it. Many people will say, look, if I'm using a bipolar recording, and that really is an integration of the two unipolar recordings from that electrode pair, why do I need to consider the two unipolar recordings separately? Well, there actually is additional information that can be provided, and we're going to go through some cases that hopefully demonstrate that. Here's case number one. It's a PVC ablation case, and you can see first the distal ablation pair of electrodes with its bipolar electrogram recording. If we were to drop a vertical caliper at the sharp initial deflection in this electrogram, it tells you what the local activation time would be. And at first you might say, okay, this isn't a good spot. Let me move the catheter because I'm not even in front of the PVC itself. And you might totally ignore the fact that there's a small little hump that precedes it. It's of low amplitude and it's round. But if you look at the unipolar recordings from the first and second electrodes that make up that distal bipole, you'll actually see that there are large deflections. This is, of course, uh, amplified in terms of its gain. But you can see that there are deflections that are recorded from those electrodes that tell you that somewhere nearby in that extended field of view, there is myocardium that is being activated a little bit earlier than where the local activation signal is being inscribed. That tells you you're close and you may move in one direction or another in order to try to get a sharp recording that times with that far field signal. So lesson number one is do not ignore far field signals on bipolar recordings and you can see how that correlates with unipolar signals that may show earlier recordings than the local activation time on the bipole. Here's another example that's a little more subtle but makes the same point. If you first were to look at the bipolar recording in the ablation distal channel here, and by the way, please ignore these that reflect atrial activation from a retrograde P wave, you'll see that there are multiple deflections in this ventricular bipolar recording. The local activation time where the wavefront passes between the two electrodes of this bipole is actually the very sharp, steep deflection here. And I'm going to put a vertical caliper at that site, which raises the question, what is that more blunt signal that precedes the local activation time? And the answer, of course, looking at the unipolar recordings, showing an earlier activation time, and looking at the nature of this early signal, which is blunt and not sharp, both suggest that this is a far field signal 
if you're looking for the wavefront passing that tissue, you're going to need to move the mapping catheter to a location where you have that early timing, but a much sharper signal. Here is another complicated signal to interpret. If you look at the ablation distal recording, there are again multiple deflections. Some people who are optimistic and really are eager to get to the site of origin of this PVC might annotate this local activation time right at the very first deflection, even though it is blunt. Other people might say, well, let me go to where the amplitude is greater, the very first uh, large amplitude deflection, whether it's sharp or blunt. But it's hard to know exactly which is the local activation time where the wavefront passes between the two electrodes of this bipole. If you look at the unipolar recordings, you'll actually see that the sharp downstroke signifying wavefront moving away from unipolar one and unipolar two electrodes is actually a little bit later, suggesting that in fact, this may be the local activation time at this location. And in fact, the earlier stuff is far field. If you were to ablate at this site thinking, oh, it's early, you actually may be ablating where there is actually only a far field signal being recorded. If you look carefully, you'll notice that the proximal pair of electrodes shows some sharp deflections that are earlier. And in fact, the unipolar two on the distal electrode is a little bit earlier than unipolar one in terms of its downstroke. So probably this catheter needs to be pulled back in order to get the distal pair of electrodes over the site of origin and get a sharp electrogram at the earliest possible time at the distal tip of the catheter. Okay, so you might say, I don't really need unipolar recordings once I've learned to distinguish the more blunt far field signals on a bipolar recording from the really sharp, steep near field signals from the bipolar recording. And that may be true, although sometimes it's not so crystal clear and the unipolar recordings do help. But here's an example where it really is confusing and the unipolar signals are critical to catheter positioning for a successful ablation site. Look here at the ablation distal bipolar signal. It's sharp, it's early. When you drop a caliper, it's before the PVC, and in fact, it's the earliest site you've recorded on your activation map. If you were to ablate here, however, you would not succeed in ablating the PVC, and it's only the unipolar signals that will show you why. Remember that that distal bipole is made of two unipolar signals that are blended. So if you see a sharp signal, it may be recorded on the proximal electrode and not the distal. Look at the two unipolar signals I've just displayed below. The sharper downstroke is actually on uni two. So that unipolar recording is more closely associated with the site of origin of this PVC rather than the first electrode, uh, uni one, where there's actually a less sharp descent and a slightly later onset of the unipolar recording. However, because there is that sharp signal on uni two, it will show up in the combined bipolar signal. But if you leave the catheter at this location and ablate at the distal tip, you may be ablating in the wrong site and there's a smaller chance that you'll be successful at this location. What you need to do here is to pull the catheter back just a little bit so that electrode one is sitting where electrode two was. And then you can see the same early sharp signal on the bipole, but now a much sharper descent in the uni one recording where you're going to be ablating. One additional point that I want to make on this slide is that I mentioned that manually one would typically annotate the local activation time for this bipolar signal at this first sharp deflection. It's important to recognize that new software programs are taking into account the unipolar recordings, especially from the distal electrode when annotating the local activation time on the bipolar signal. In this fashion, if this point were to be annotated automatically, the line would not be placed where I've demonstrated it here because the unipolar maximum negative downslope is later. So this bipolar electrogram would be annotated later in the signal, not earlier. And in that way, we can differentiate a sharp early deflection that is a consequence of the unipolar two part of the electrogram from unipolar 
one. But if one were to manually change it to this point, then you'd actually lose that information. So again, it's important, whether it's manually done or whether it's through an automated program, to take into account the unipolar signal. This is actually the holy grail when you're looking for a focal site of origin. You want to see a sharp bipolar signal that's as early as anywhere you've recorded, and you want to see very sharp descent on the uni-1 electrode that is exactly at the same time, and you do not want to see any far field signals on any of the channels, suggesting that there may be tissue being activated earlier. This was, in fact, the successful ablation site for this PVC, and it was confirmed by combining the information provided in the bipolar and the unipolar recording channels so that you can ablate this with the very first RF lesion. Now that we've discussed at length how you record and interpret unipolar and bipolar electrograms, let's get into the nuts and bolts of why we actually put catheters in the heart and how we describe catheter locations so that we can synthesize the information that's gathered from multiple bipoles at the same time. Let's review why we bother putting catheters in the heart in the first place. The main reason is so that we can record small signals from inside the heart that are not seen on the surface EKG. For example, from the bundle of Hiss. If you put a catheter inside the heart, right next to where the bundle of Hiss is located at the tricuspid annulus, you can record a small deflection. But because the mass of myocardium being depolarized is so small, it can't possibly generate a signal on the surface EKG, so it's invisible. Similarly, during an arrhythmia such as ventricular tachycardia, you see the surface QRS complexes that reflect the bulk of the myocardium being depolarized, but something has to be happening between the QRSs if it's a reentrant rhythm. And it's only when you put a catheter inside the heart in an area of myocardial scar where there are small slips of live but sick myocardial tissue being activated slowly between the QRS complexes that we can finally record them to see what is their location and to direct catheter ablation. And during any rhythm, if you see fractionated signals that are very small, it can tell you that this tissue you're sitting against is made of myocardial scar interspersed with live but sick and slowly conducting myocardial cells that can be the substrate for reentry. If it's a small amount of mass, then you're again not going to see these signals on the EKG surface. It's important sometimes for us to record the timing between signals. For example, when we look at the surface PR interval, that doesn't tell us how much of that interval is made up of electrical signals traveling through the AV node and how much is traveling through the his purkinje system. But when you can record an intracardiac his bundle potential, you can now split up that PR interval into two components. The first part, the segment that goes through the AV node, and the second part, the signal passing through the his purkinje system. And that can be important in detecting certain disease states, especially when there is clinical evidence of signals not able to get from atrium to ventricles, and you want to know the consequences of that second degree AV block. And lastly, we want to look at the activation sequence. We can often guess where the origin of a signal is coming from and where a wavefront is headed by looking at the surface EKG, either the P wave or the QRS. But if you want very detailed information about how a wavefront is traveling across myocardial tissue, we put catheters in the heart and record from multiple sites. So for example, during sinus rhythm or during pacing, we can figure out how the atria and the ventricles are connected to each other. Is it only through the AV node or is there an accessory pathway present? And if there's an arrhythmia occurring, such as atrial flutter or a focal atrial tachycardia, we can really pinpoint with high precision by recording bipolar electrograms from multiple sites in the chambers of interest, the exact timing to define where the cir circuit is located or where the focal tachycardia is coming from. If we are to fully appreciate using intracardiac catheters, the way wavefronts move through cardiac tissue, you need to be recording local potentials at multiple positions at once. This means putting multiple catheters up in the heart 
and each catheter that you place usually has multiple pairs of electrodes on it. The catheters are strategically positioned at locations where we want to know the timing of activation. For a moment though in this image, let's forget that four of these five catheters are even present and focus just on one of them. This catheter is sitting in the coronary sinus between the left atrium and the left ventricle along the posterior aspect of the mitral valve. And here I've outlined roughly in this LAO view where the left and right atria might sit. If you were to record from these five pairs of electrodes that I'm arbitrarily labeling A through E, A sitting at the interatrial septum and E sitting at the lateral aspect of the left atrium, and a single beat occurred, and here are the recordings during that beat, we can see right away instantaneously that because the signal was inscribed at position A, followed by B, then C, then D, then E, that this beat must have originated rightward from the electrode pair labeled A, meaning from the interatrial septum or from the right atrium. If there had been a signal that originated from the lateral aspect of the left atrium, and traveled in this direction, then we would have seen the bipolar recording in E first. If there had been a signal originating from the left atrial roof that then came down and activated the floor of the left atrium, you would have seen perhaps more simultaneous activation of all of these pairs of electrodes rather than sequential. So you can see the power of recording from multiple places at once. In this case, only five pairs of electrodes in the coronary sinus. Imagine what you can do with more catheters in place and also a roving mapping catheter recording multiple sites beyond where fixed catheters are positioned. The more catheters that are advanced up into the heart, the more data will be displayed on the screen at the same time. So it becomes very important to label every electrogram channel so that you know exactly what catheters are in the heart, where they're located, and what electrodes are being viewed. Here are some standard labels that are used when you see multiple channels on the screen at the same time to keep things organized. HRA stands for high right atrium. HIS or HBE stands for the HIS bundle electrogram catheter. RVA stands for right ventricular apex catheter. CS stands for coronary sinus, where typically a decapolar 10 pole catheter or a 20 pole catheter is placed. ABL stands for the ablation catheter. DUO or RA is used usually to represent a 20 pole catheter that can be looped around the circumference of the right atrium, typically during flutter procedures. HALO is another type of 20 pole catheter that has a slightly different shape that's also looped around the right atrium and is also used for flutter procedures. LASSO or SPIRAL stands for a much smaller circular catheter, usually with 10 or 20 electrodes on it, that's positioned inside a vein, usually a pulmonary vein in the left atrium during AFib ablations, or sometimes in the superior vena cava if that structure is being targeted. PENTA stands for PENTA-RAY, which is a five-pronged starfish-like catheter that has a total of 20 electrodes on it as well, and is used in various chambers when you want to record multiple bipoles at the same time. There's a consistent way that we number the electrodes on all catheters, and that is starting from the end of the catheter and working backwards. So the distal electrode in all catheters is always known as electrode number one, and then working backwards depending on the number of electrodes that exist. When you have a simple catheter like this quadrupolar catheter, we sometimes talk about pairs of electrodes instead of the numbers. So we may call this pair the distal pair of electrodes, the mid pair of electrodes, or the proximal pair of electrodes. So for example, if you have a high right atrial catheter, you may see a label on the screen, HRA-D, that suggests you're talking about the distal pair of electrodes, or a His bundle catheter, HBE-M, that's the middle pair of the quadrupolar catheter positioned at the His. When you have many more electrodes than four, we generally deal with numbers, again, numbering from the end of the catheter backwards. So in this 20-pole catheter, you'll see a label duo 
one, two, or duo, nine, ten, and that'll tell you which pair of electrodes you're dealing with in that recording. And same thing with a circular catheter. Even though it's a circle, it still has an end. So we'll number the electrodes from the distal end backwards, starting at 1, and in this case, ending at 20, because it's a 20-pole catheter. Ablation catheters are quadrupolar catheters, and they're typically labeled in two electrode pairs. So if you see ABL-D, that's the distal pair of electrodes, which includes the ablation electrode itself at the catheter end. When we're dealing with unipolar recordings, we will number these electrodes one through four. So it's important to know that distinction when looking at ablation catheter electrograms. So where do we position catheters in the heart during a standard electrophysiology procedure? We take into consideration the normal activation of the heart, starting at the sinus node, sweeping across the right and the left atrium, going through the AV node and the his Purkinje system, and we position catheters at places that are accessible from the right side of the heart, because typically we don't like to enter the femoral artery if we don't have to, we don't like to enter the systemic circulation if we don't have to, but we do like to record from strategic locations nonetheless. So typically we'll position a catheter in the high right atrium near the sinus node where beats start. We'll position a catheter at the His bundle electrogram as we discussed before so that we can assess atrioventricular conduction. We position a catheter down in the ventricles in the right ventricular apex so that we can assess ventricular activation. And so that we can look at the left side of the heart, we take advantage of the coronary sinus and we position typically a 10-pole catheter with five pairs of electrodes in the coronary sinus to record the left atrial activation. Here is an RAO and an LAO view of a standard electrophysiology setup where you have the high right atrial catheter positioned in the high right atrium as seen in these two views, the right ventricular apical catheter extending toward the right in the RAO view and coming straight out at us in the LAO view, the His bundle catheter positioned right at the tricuspid annulus on the septum, and the coronary sinus catheter going into the screen in the RAO view and traveling leftward in the LAO view. And because of the way the heart activates during sinus rhythm and what's accessible from the femoral vein, these typically are the places that catheters are positioned during a standard EP study. Let's keep moving forward now and look at how electrograms from multiple channels are displayed on the screen at the same time and get into the information that they provide. First, let's talk about the speed with which signals are displayed on the screen. On an EKG, we call this paper speed. Obviously, electronically, there's no paper involved. But let's quickly look at displaying information at different speeds on the screen. We're used to seeing on an EKG a 25 millimeter per second paper speed. And that's what's shown here, including multiple intracardiac channels. And the surface EKG looks exactly like we would expect in the top three channels here. The problem in the electrophysiology lab is that if we display our electrograms at this same relatively slow speed, then you're going to see a lot of electrograms appearing to be simultaneous and figuring out what comes before what and measuring the timing between intervals can get very difficult because everything is squished together. As a consequence, we actually uh, display usually at four or eight times that speed on the screen in the EP lab. So it looks something like the image on the right, which is shown at 200 millimeters per second. So now the surface EKG looks a little funny because it's stretched out horizontally. However, the electrograms are stretched out as well, which can be very helpful when we're talking about measuring intervals between one electrogram and another, or looking at the sequence of things, which is much clearer now that we've stretched things out compared to the image on the left. When multiple channels are displayed at the same time on the screen, 
usually people will have a specific sequence that they'll use so that you can see the same pattern over and over again to recognize normal versus abnormal electrical conduction through the cardiac chambers. Usually at the top, the surface EKG leads are displayed, followed by a sequence of electrograms that usually rely on the sequence in sinus rhythm, so that the high right atrial catheter is displayed first, signals travel across the right atrium and reach the bundle of His catheter, and then they travel across the left atrium, so the coronary sinus electrodes are displayed, and the beat gets down to the ventricle so that the right ventricular apex is usually displayed at the bottom. Sometimes people will display the coronary sinus catheter with 910 at the top because then you'll get a sequence that is top to bottom in terms of how sinus rhythm transmits across the heart. Other people like to use the numeric version and put 1-2 at the top, in which case the signals will have a bottom to top sequence in sinus rhythm. Some people like to group different electrograms together, for example, here on the right, so that your eye can track patterns in a little different way. So here, the His bundle recordings are grouped together, the coronary sinus recordings are bundled together, and it's just individual preference whether or not to bunch the electrograms that are from the same catheter together, separating them out from adjacent catheter electrogram tracings. When we print out snapshots and present them on screens like this, we usually get a black and white version. But in the EP lab, we have additional features at our disposal to make things easier to see and sort out. And that includes coloring the electrograms. This is the color system that I personally use, where I will display the high right atrial catheter in green, the His bundle catheter in yellow, the coronary sinus in white, and the right ventricle signal in lavender. But everybody has their own preference and there have been some debates about what is the convention and there really is no convention. It's whatever makes you comfortable, but using the same pattern over and over again makes things much easier when you interpret electrograms during an EP procedure. Let's review the electrograms that will be recorded by the five pairs of electrodes in this decapolar catheter that is positioned across the tricuspid annulus, spanning from the right atrium toward the right ventricle and passing the bundle of His. If you look at the drawing in the top right, I'm going to show now where this decapolar catheter is sitting. And we can use that drawing to understand the five electrogram patterns that are recorded from these pairs of electrodes. I'm going to actually show the surface EKG so that we can better understand the timing of the electrograms uh, compared to what's going on in the heart as a whole. If we start here at the 910 pair of electrodes, we can see that it is sitting in the right atrium and it's far enough away from the His bundle and the right ventricle so that it's only recording an atrial electrogram. This times with the surface P wave and maybe you can see a far field hint of a signal that times with the QRS complex, but mainly this is sitting in the atrium and recording an electrogram that's appropriate for that location. As we move to pair 7-8, this is now positioned right at the annulus and right near the bundle of His, so that we actually see three different electrogram inscriptions on this channel. An atrial electrogram that times with the P wave, a ventricular electrogram that times with the QRS complex, and in between the two during the PR segment, we see a third recording, and this represents a direct recording of the bundle of His. As we move forward toward pair 5-6, we start moving away from atrial tissue, so we're getting more of a far field small signal that times with the P wave, a larger ventricular signal that's actually clipped. We actually limit its size, and that's why it looks squared off here at both ends. And we're still recording a His bundle potential between the P wave and the QRS complex on the surface. As we continue to move forward, 
we actually see a small signal that's a little bit later than where the His bundle signal was. And this is probably a signal from the right bundle branch, which runs along the inner surface of the right ventricular septum. And of course, we still see a ventricular signal timing with the QRS. Lastly, as we move toward pair one, two, we see only a ventricular electrogram having moved far enough away from the conduction system and the atrial tissue that we no longer see electrograms from those structures. Let's now analyze a multi-channel recording that's about as simple as we can get in the EP lab. Here we see at the top three surface EKG leads labeled on the left. We have a catheter in the high right atrium giving us an electrogram here near the sinus node. We have a quadrupolar His catheter and we're displaying two of the three pairs labeled mid and distal. And we can see the atrial, the His, and the ventricular signal as we reviewed in the previous slide. And we have a catheter that's all the way down in the right ventricular apex showing us a ventricular electrogram that times with the surface QRS. Why is it important to record a bundle of Hiss? We discussed this earlier when we talked about dividing up the PR interval into its two components, the AV node part and the Hiss Purkinje part. As signals travel from atrium to ventricle, of course, it must travel through the AV node first and then to the Hiss bundle and then down the bundle branches in the Hiss Purkinje tree. On the surface though, of course, we can only see the P wave and the QRS and none of those structures in between. So when we record a bundle of Hiss shown here, that gives us a halfway point, which actually isn't halfway because it usually takes longer to get through the AV node than it takes to get down the His Purkinje system because those different parts of the conduction system behave very differently. But now we can measure the time it takes to get from local atrial tissue through the AV node to that His bundle and this is known as the AH interval, A for atrium and H for His. And we can measure how long it takes to get from the His bundle down to the beginning of the QRS, known as the HV interval, from the His bundle down to the ventricle. And in this way, we can look when patients have a long PR interval or evidence of AV conduction block where the problem is located, because if there's a problem with the AV node versus a problem with the His Purkinje system, there are very different implications in terms of the timing of progression and the safety of the patient dictating the necessary treatment. So let's start getting comfortable with looking at intracardiac electrogram recordings when there are multiple catheters in the heart and more than one beat on the page. The simplest and most straightforward electrophysiology studies involve three catheters placed in the heart, one at the high right atrium, one at the bundle of His, and one in the right ventricle. And let's use this example of second degree heart block to show how these recordings can be useful. Here is a surface EKG from a patient with second degree heart block showing five P waves and four QRS complexes. P wave number four does not conduct successfully through to the ventricles. And we can see that the PR interval is gradually prolonging before the dropped P wave and shortens back up afterward. This is a classic AV Wenckebach pattern. If we add the intracardiac recordings from those three catheters I mentioned, this is what we'll see. The first thing that's most important to recognize is which electrograms couple with which beats on the surface EKG. And as you get more experienced, you'll learn to do this automatically. But I'm going to help you with this particular example by boxing in each individual beat along with its intracardiac electrograms. The first thing to note is that the high right atrial channel shows a deflection that times with the P wave in each of these five instances. And then the right ventricular electrogram times with the surface QRS. And there are four of those with the fourth beat being absent. And then as we reviewed before, the His bundle electrogram, which records signals from the atrium, the ventricle, 
and the bundle of hiss itself because all of those are within the field of view of this particular bipole. And I'm going to label those for you right here. Notice that as the PR interval prolongs on the surface, it is the AH interval on the intracardiac recordings that is prolonging, where the HV interval is staying constant. This tells us that the point of prolongation is in the AV node and not in the his Purkinje system. On top of that, notice that on beat number four, there's actually no his bundle deflection, suggesting that this P wave blocked in the AV node before the signal even got to the bundle of his. Those findings combined tell us that AV Wenckebach, when it is seen, uh, is caused by delay and then block in the AV node in this case and not in the his Purkinje system. Let's add yet more intracardiac electrograms to the display. We can see here, going from top to bottom, that we have on the top three surface EKG leads as labeled, a high right atrial catheter with a signal that times with the surface P wave, a His bundle catheter, and we're showing the proximal, mid, and distal signals as labeled, now we have a coronary sinus catheter in place that records signals from the left atrium because that's where the coronary sinus runs. In addition, there are some very small far field signals from the left ventricle base. And then lastly, we have a right ventricular apex catheter with that sharp electrogram timing with the surface QRS. Notice that the way this is displayed is consistent with signals traveling from the sinus node across the right and then the left atrium, giving us electrogram depolarizations that go from top to bottom and left to right. Again, as I mentioned in a previous uh, slide, some people like to order things differently on the screen, but this is my particular preference. So the high right atrial catheter is activated first in sinus rhythm. The signal sweeps across the right atrium and is then recorded in the His catheter, which is at the low interatrial septum. And then as the signal sweeps outward across the left atrium from right to left, we have deflections in the proximal pair of electrodes CS910, then 78 and all the way out to 12. Then, as the signal travels through the AV node that's reflected in this AH interval, the signal gets through the AV node, reaches the His bundle, where you see a His bundle deflection, and then gets through to the ventricles, creating a surface QRS, deflections on the His catheter, which can see the base of the ventricle in its field of view, and also the right ventricular apical catheter, which is, of course, positioned in the ventricle itself. It's important to recognize what a sinus beat looks like so that when you see other beats, you can compare and contrast them to this template. Here are two beats on the screen, and I'll ask you to think for a moment, if you want to hit pause, which beat reflects what type of uh, cardiac event. I'll tell you now at the outset, the second beat on the page is again a sinus beat, and you know that because on the surface you have a P wave in front of a relatively narrow QRS, remembering the fast paper speed, and you have a sequence in the atrial signals going from high right atrium near the sinus node first, traveling across the right atrium, and then traveling across the left atrium, and then the His bundle deflection, and then the ventricular deflections. If you look at the first beat on the page, however, you'll notice first on the surface the QRS is wider suggesting that this is not traveling down the full his Purkinje tree or using it at all. And the next thing you may notice is that the atrial events, which we know clearly look like this on beat number two, the sinus beat, in this case are coming later than the ventricular events. Notice the first event to happen is in the right ventricular apex catheter. All of this information combined suggests that this beat is a premature ventricular beat, a PVC, because the events start in the ventricle, not the atria. So the ventricular electrograms happen first, and then that beat happens to conduct retrograde back up to the atrium through the His Purkinje system, up through the AV node, and initially to the interatrial septum near the bundle of His recording, which is why the atrial signals in the His catheter happen first. The signal then simultaneously travels right to left 
out toward the left atrium, as you can see from the deflections in the CS catheter, but it's also simultaneously sending a wavefront across the right atrium back toward the high right atrial catheter near the sinus node in the superior vena cava. So these happen more or less simultaneously, but later than the septum is activated. The reason that we know this beat, of course, is not a sinus beat that happens to occur on top of the PVC is because the high right atrial event happens late rather than early. This is the sequence we would have seen if this were a simultaneous sinus beat on top of the PVC. Here are three beats on this page and maybe hit pause and reflect for a moment if you can identify what is the nature of these three beats. Because there are three and two of them are close together, I'm going to start by showing you which signals belong to which beat. And the next thing I'll point you to is that beats one and three look very familiar. In fact, those are both sinus beats, and you can tell again because of the activation sequence in the intracardiac electrogram channels with the high right atrium first and so on as we've discussed twice before. The second beat, however, shows a narrow QRS that happens after a P wave, but notice that the activation sequence in the atrial electrograms is different. Now you might say, well, this looks like the previous retrograde conduction after a PVC that we saw in the previous slide, but this is not a PVC because we have a skinny QRS, just like in sinus rhythm, which follows the atrial events and follows the His bundle recording. So instead, this early beat is a premature atrial beat, a PAC, and we can pinpoint more or less where it's coming from, from the few electrodes that we have in the heart. We can see that the septum, the low septum is activated before the high right atrium and before the left atrium. So this is a PAC coming at least closest to the His bundle catheter. So probably coming from the interatrial septum or possibly low in the right atrium, much closer to the His catheter than the HRA catheter. So this is what a PAC would look like that's originating from that location. And lastly, here are two beats on this page. And by now you're an expert and you can tell that beat number two is a sinus beat for all the reasons we've discussed. And you can tell that beat number one is not a PVC because the atrial events happen first and the QRS is skinny, just like in sinus rhythm and it follows the atrial events and the His bundle deflection. But now the earliest atrial activation is way out over here in the left atrium towards CS34 or CS12. So this is a premature atrial beat that is happening and originating from the left atrium rather than the septum and certainly not the sinus node because here the high right atrial catheter is activated at the very latest. So we can tell it's an atrial event and we can more or less tell the region of origin from looking at the electrogram sequence from the locations that we're recording from. Let's go back and actually think a little bit more in depth about AV connections. I showed you in the last module this example of AV Wankebach on the surface EKG and how it correlated with prolongation of the AH interval, the time it took to get through the AV node, and how on the P wave that doesn't conduct, there's no His bundle recording because the signal blocked in the AV node above the level of the bundle of His where that recording is made. Let's contrast that example with this one, another patient with second degree heart block. And you can see from the surface EKG here, there are two P waves and the second one conducts down to the ventricles creating a QRS, but the first one does not. Let's see what the intracardiac electrograms look like. Here we can see that both P waves are of course associated with atrial deflections. We can see that here and here, those time with the P wave on the surface. 
And both beats, the blocked and the one that conducts, also have a bundle of hiss recording, seen here and seen here. But the first beat that blocks has no ventricular electrogram, which is not surprising because there's no surface QRS, compared to the second beat where there is a ventricular electrogram that times with the surface QRS. So what we can see here is that the blocked P wave clearly sent a signal that got through the AV node to the bundle of Hiss, and then it was beyond the bundle of Hiss that the signal blocked and didn't get down to the ventricles. This is known as subnodal block below the level of the AV node, and in this case below where the bundle of Hiss recording was made. And it's important to distinguish block in the AV node from block below the AV node because the former tends to follow a more gradual course that tends to be a little more benign in the short term, whereas the latter block below the AV node can suddenly result in AV block with asystole or prolonged pauses that can be even life-threatening if not simply causing syncope with injury. So an intracardiac recording can verify what we might have guessed from the surface EKG pattern comparing MOBITS 1 AV node level block versus MOBITS 2 below the AV node in the his Purkinje system. The other point I wanted to make on this slide is to note that on the beat that conducts, the HV interval is actually quite long. And let's review what I mean by long on the next slide. Normally, the HV interval with a normal Hisperkinji network is about 40 to 60 milliseconds. And in this case, it actually is about 100 milliseconds, which even though it's only 40 milliseconds beyond the upper limit of normal, for a Hisperkinji system, that's really, really abnormally slow, suggesting disease in the Hisperkinji system, even if we hadn't seen block occur. And for comparison, here's a normal HV interval of 40 milliseconds. So if we were to see somebody with very long HV conduction time, we actually would recommend a pacemaker because a sick Hisperkinji system can potentially suddenly fail, leaving a patient with an absent or an extremely slow heart rate at an unpredictable timetable. What about a short HV interval like in this case? I've labeled in the His catheter the A, the H, and the V deflections. And if we measure the His bundle deflection to the very earliest part of the surface QRS, which starts here, I told you normal is about 40 to 60 milliseconds. Here we're only five milliseconds. And the question is, how is that possible? Remembering, of course, that the HV interval reflects the time it takes after the signal gets through the AV node to then get down the his Purkinje system. Well, is it possible that this patient has super duper fast conduction down the his Purkinje system? So instead of 40 milliseconds, it can race down in five milliseconds. And the answer is no, that doesn't happen. So the only way to explain a short HV interval is that the ventricles must have been activated in a way other than through the normal conduction system. This can happen in two predominant fashions. One is there could have been a PVC that happened to occur smack on top of a sinus beat, but sooner than conduction would have activated the ventricles, or in this case, you could have gotten from atrium to ventricle through a different route other than the normal AV node in his Purkinje network, that being an accessory pathway. So there are two things happening in parallel. While a wavefront is passing down the AV node and down the his Purkinje system, also a second wavefront is able to conduct from right atrium to right ventricle or left atrium to left ventricle or in the interatrial septum to the ventricular septum, and that can happen much faster than the delay that normally results from going down the AV node and then down the his Purkinje system. So when you see a short HV interval, especially if it's on every single beat, you should be thinking that there's an accessory pathway present. Let's now think about how the ventricles are electrically attached to the atria.
It's important in any full EP study to look at retrograde conduction and not just anterograde conduction. Sometimes there's an accessory pathway that's only capable of conducting in one direction, and usually that's backwards from ventricles to atria. And if you only did atrial pacing, you might miss the fact that there's an accessory pathway present. So you have to do ventricular pacing in order to detect what's known as a concealed accessory pathway that only conducts upward. This screen initially may look a little bit confusing, and I'm going to eliminate some of the electrogram channels for you because they're not important to the question that I'm asking right now. In the future, as you get more comfortable looking at electrogram screens, you're automatically going to draw your eye toward the electrograms of interest and ignore the ones that aren't important for the question you're asking at that moment. There's ventricular pacing occurring in this image reflected on the surface with little pacing artifacts before each wide QRS. And also there's a channel at the bottom that shows us that pacing is occurring. If we look at the atrial activation sequence, we can see the very first atrial electrogram that's shown is in CS910. And then the wavefront travels leftward out toward CS12, the lateral left atrium, but also at the same time, it travels laterally to the right toward the high right atrial catheter, which is also late. We talked in a previous slide about a PAC that came from the interatrial septum and traveled at the same time leftward and rightward. And this is a similar scenario, except now the septum is being activated first because of retrograde conduction through the AV node, which is located on the interatrial septum. So the two atrial beats that we see are, show activation of the septum first and then out toward the left and out toward the right atrium, consistent with conduction over the AV node in this fashion. Contrast that with this image where we're also ventricular pacing and we see the opposite activation sequence in the coronary sinus catheter. Here, the atrial electrogram in CS12 is first, and the signal then travels left to right across the left atrium, and then getting to the high right atrial catheter at the very end. Well, the AV node, as I said, is located on the interatrial septum, not out at the left lateral part of the left atrium. So it's not possible, especially considering the fact that this pattern is seen beat after beat after beat, it's not possible that this retrograde conduction is occurring over the AV node because the AV node is not located out here. This image instantly tells us that we have a left lateral accessory pathway. And that explains this, what's called an eccentric or an eccentric activation sequence. Let's think about it in the LAO view of this fluoroscopy image. You see the CS catheter labeled. And remember, of course, that 1, 2 is at the tip. 9, 10 is here toward the interatrial septum. And if we pace in the right ventricle on the left, we're conducting up the AV node, which is right at the septum and traveling right to left across the floor of the left atrium. And the right image where we have an accessory pathway present, the opposite is happening, where we're reaching the atrial tissue nearest pair one, two in the coronary sinus first, and then traveling back in the opposite direction. I had mentioned earlier that the more electrode pairs you have in the heart, the more simultaneous information you can get about activation sequence. Having a 20 pole catheter in the right atrium during atrial flutter is a great example of the power of having multiple electrodes simultaneously recording and let's review such a case. Here is a 20 pole catheter that's wrapped around the right atrium with the tip of the catheter extending out into the coronary sinus over here. In this case, normally, of course, we number the electrodes one through 20, but because of the subsequent slides numbering electrode pairs rather than individual electrodes, we're going to talk about electrode pairs one through 10, numbering from the end backwards. And to give you a sense of where this catheter is sitting, I've shaded roughly where the left and the right atria are sitting. 
in this LAO fluoroscopy view. Here is the presenting atrial flutter rhythm. And first thing you should look at is the surface EKG. In the inferior leads shown here in AVF, you have the classic sawtoothed pattern consistent with counterclockwise right atrial flutter. How can we confirm that using intracardiac recordings? We look at the 10 electrode pairs on this 20 pole catheter, and we look at the activation sequence. Notice that in duodeca 10, the electrogram happens first, followed by nine, then eight, then seven, then six, all the way to one. And this happens over and over again. And this can tell us at a glance that the wave front during this tachycardia must be traveling in this counterclockwise direction around the right atrium and then out the coronary sinus and out toward the left atrium. Let's think for a moment about where the right atrial flutter circuit is located. The wavefront travels down the lateral wall of the right atrium, across the floor, up the interatrial septum, back across the right atrial roof, and back down the lateral part of the right atrium again. The left atrium is activated passively and is not part of the circuit. Let me introduce you to a concept called entrainment pacing, and the basic concept is this. You can pace in the heart from any pair of electrodes a little faster than the tachycardia, thereby accelerating the rate, and you can come off pacing, and you can then measure the time between the last paced beat and the first electrogram in that same channel from which you were pacing. If you're pacing from within the circuit, that measurement, the last paced beat to the first electrogram of the next beat, will be identical, the same, as the tachycardia cycle length. If you're pacing away from the circuit, then that interval after pacing, called the post-pacing interval, will be longer than the actual tachycardia cycle length. And here is an example so that we can pinpoint the location of this right atrial flutter circuit more precisely. If we pace from electrode pair one, duo one, shown here, the last paced beat, and come off pacing and measure how long it takes to get to the first electrogram in that same channel, it's longer than the tachycardia cycle length, telling us that this location is not in the flutter circuit. And that's important to recognize because you don't have all atrial flutters traveling around the right atrium. You can have a left atrial flutter and you can have flutter circuits that involve scar and not an entire chamber. So this type of pacing maneuver done at multiple sites can help pinpoint the exact location and extent of a flutter circuit. If we now pace from duo five, the fifth pair of electrodes, which is now on the lateral floor of the right atrium and in the circuit, we're going to see that that post pacing interval, the last paced beat to the first electrogram on the next beat is the same as the tachycardia cycle length, telling us that this pair of electrodes is in the circuit. And likewise, if we pace up here at duo nine, we're going to see the same phenomenon. If we pace and stop pacing, we're going to show that that post pacing interval, abbreviated PPI, is the same timing as the tachycardia after we come off pacing, telling us that this electrode pair is also in the circuit. And lastly, and most importantly, if we put an ablation electrode on the floor of the right atrium in the place where you would plan to ablate, we want that, of course, to be in the circuit because we want to ablate and cut off the circuit itself. And here we see pacing in that ablation catheter on the isthmus, the area between the inferior vena cava and the tricuspid valve. And again, the post pacing interval is the same as the tachycardia telling us that this location is also in the circuit. So in summary, we have found that all places we've paced around the circumference of the right atrium 
are in the flutter circuit. And when we pace from the floor of the left atrium in the coronary sinus that is out of the circuit, this further confirms that we're dealing with counterclockwise right atrial flutter and we can proceed with catheter ablation. Sure enough, when lesions are placed with a radiofrequency catheter across the floor of the right atrium in the isthmus between the inferior vena cava and the tricuspid annulus, the flutter stops. You can see that occurring right here in the middle of the screen. Moreover, you can see that the flutter stops exactly where you would expect it to. Notice that the last electrogram to be inscribed is occurring in duo five, but there's no electrogram in duo four, which is seen on the second to last beat. That's because we're ablating here right at electrode pair four, so that when this flutter circuit is coming around for the last time and finally meets block, it's able to get to pair five, but not beyond that because of that's where the ablation has been performed. So this makes perfect sense looking at the activation sequence during tachycardia and at the time of termination during radiofrequency ablation. If we pace from the coronary sinus, however, after the flutter has terminated, we see this pattern and let's analyze it. As we pace from electrode pair one in the coronary sinus, located over here, that wavefront is gonna move in all directions, including across the floor toward the right atrium and up the interatrial septum over the roof. And what's happening in the electrograms up top here is a demonstration that the wavefront is traveling from pair one to two to three to four to five to six. That goes through and past where we had been making our ablation lesions, suggesting that even though the flutter terminated, signals are still able to travel across the floor, across the isthmus and up the lateral wall. It's only with additional ablation lesions that isthmus block is finally achieved. And you can see that on the third paced beat on the screen here, where the activation sequence suddenly changed from what had been seen before. What makes this difference? Now there's block at the level of pair four, which is where the ablation lesions are being created. So in order for the uh, wavefront to travel to electrode pair five, it can no longer travel across the isthmus, which is now blocked, but instead it has to travel over the roof and all the way down and eventually get to electrode pair five. That's the only way that that pair can be activated. And that's the reason for the change in the activation sequence on the duodeca catheter. Look at what happened to electrode pair five before. It was following electrode four and before number six. But when block occurs, now you get to four, hit a roadblock, and you have to wait for the signal to travel over the roof, 10, nine, eight, and all the way down to five on the lateral side of the line. This confirms that we have block at the cavotricuspid isthmus. And again, demonstrates how important it is to record from multiple sites at once when looking at activation sequence. Let's talk a little bit about pacing maneuvers that can be done in the EP lab to give us more information about the heart's electrical system. Why do we perform pacing maneuvers during an EP study? There's a whole variety of pieces of information we can gather by pacing in the atria and ventricles, and here are some of the most common. First, we can assess the health of the sinus node, as I'll show you, by pacing in the atria. We can assess AV connections, which we've partially discussed already, looking at the health of the AV node and the Hisperkinji system, and looking for any evidence of an accessory pathway that can conduct in the forward or the backward direction. Also, we can induce arrhythmias by pacing in the atria or the ventricles in different patterns, as we will review.
And if you're in a tachycardia, there are many different pacing maneuvers that can be performed, ranging from single beats to overdrive pacing faster than the tachycardia itself in order to get more information about that arrhythmia, whether it's its mechanism or its location. The two main types of pacing that we do are known as burst pacing and programmed extra stimulation. And here's what we mean by those terms. Burst pacing means that a number of beats in a row are delivered in a chamber all at the same rate, the same cycle length. It's called a burst. Programmed extra stimulation, on the other hand, is a very specific pattern where we usually will deliver eight beats at one speed and then one or two or three beats at other faster speeds. The first eight beats all at the same rate are known as S1. If you're pacing in the atrium, people may call this A1. If you're pacing in the ventricle, it's V1. And then if you deliver a single extra stimulus, it'll be known as S2 or A2 or V2, depending on where the stimulus is delivered. And then you may deliver an S3 and even an S4. The reason for the eight beats in a row at the beginning is cardiac tissue has slightly different behaviors at different speeds. So to standardize in the EP study environment, we typically pace for eight beats in a row, usually starting at 100 beats per minute, 600 milliseconds, so that we can alter the S2 and the S3, starting with exactly the same electrical environment. Here is an example of a sinus node recovery time test being done. Atrial burst pacing is performed, and you can see that atrial pacing is happening because of the pacer spike seen in the surface EKG and the artifact on the high right atrial catheter, as well as the notation at the bottom of the screen telling us that we're delivering pacing stimuli. This is performed for usually 30 seconds or more, and then we come off pacing and look how long it takes for the first sinus beat to occur. This is known as the sinus node recovery time. And there are normal parameters where we would expect the sinus node to wake up after being suppressed from burst pacing for 30 seconds or more. Here on the top is an example of a normal sinus node recovery time. And on the bottom is a very long and very abnormal sinus node recovery time, the type that might be seen in somebody who has symptomatic sinus bradycardia or even lightheaded or fainting spells. And then we discover that it's because the sinus node is not functioning properly. Here's an example of programmed stimulation being used to look at AV node function. There are many different electrograms on this screen and I wanna focus simply on the one of relevance, which is going to be in the His catheter, in fact, this specific channel at the distal pole. You can see here we've delivered a seventh and an eighth A1, and then a single A2 at a faster pace. And if we look at this His bundle recording, we're going to see four different deflections. Number one, in with the blue arrows here, we see the pacing artifact that should not be confused with an intracardiac electrogram recording from cardiac tissue. This is generated by our pacing machine. And then we see the A, H, and V intervals in that His channel recording as we've reviewed in the past. Notice on the surface EKG that the PR interval during the A1 pacing rate which is slower, is shorter, and the PR interval for that single early A2 beat that's faster is a much longer PR interval. We know that the AV node has properties called decremental properties, meaning the faster you bombard it with a signal, the slower it conducts. And we can prove that it's the AV node that's the cause of the PR prolongation by looking at the intracardiac recordings. The AH interval from the A1 beats is shorter 
and on that single A2 beat, the AH interval is much longer. And we've already reviewed that the AH interval represents the time it takes to get through the AV node. This is completely normal AV node behavior, and again, it's called decrement. The same behavior can be seen in the backwards direction during retrograde conduction. If we put in ventricular extra stimuli, V1 and V2, here's the seventh and eighth V1 beats, and the single V2 early PVC paste beat that we put in, I've colored all the ventricular events purple. I'm going to leave all the electrograms up to start to train you to look at multiple channels now at the same time. And I'm going to show the atrial electrograms in green so that you can train your eye. And if you want to pause at this point to take this all in, uh, you'll learn to differentiate what represents a ventricular signal and what represents an atrial signal. The key point here when we're doing ventricular extra stimulation and looking at retrograde conduction is that it takes longer to get up to the atria on the V2 beat. And it's the same reason that we saw a PR prolongation when pacing A1, A2 from the top. Here we're seeing retrograde decremental conduction in the AV node. In contrast, here we're also performing ventricular programmed stimulation with a 7th and 8th V1 beat and an early V2 beat. And here are the retrograde atrial electrograms. But notice now there is no evidence of decrement or prolongation of the VA time on that early V2 beat. The reason why is here we're not conducting up the AV node. Instead, we're conducting up an accessory pathway. And you might say, wait a minute, I thought you said earlier that when you conduct retrograde up an accessory pathway that the coronary sinus activation is eccentric, earliest out at one, two. Well, that's only true if you have a left lateral accessory pathway that's far away from the AV node. But what if you have an accessory pathway on the septum? or connecting the right atrium to the right ventricle. In those cases, if you pace in the ventricle, conduct retrograde over a septal or a right-sided pathway, you're going to activate the left atrium where the coronary sinus catheter is sitting from a right to left direction, just like with the AV node retrograde activation. So one of the ways we can distinguish retrograde conduction over the AV node versus retrograde conduction over a septal or a right-sided pathway is to look for decrement, which is the behavior of AV node tissue, but usually is not the behavior of accessory pathway tissue. And here, when we paced earlier and earlier with the V2 beat, we did not see prolongation of the VA time, telling us that we were not likely conducting over AV node tissue, but instead this was a concealed accessory pathway. Let's get a little more sophisticated with some pacing maneuvers to finish up this section on intracardiac electrograms. Here's a pretty typical screen of multiple catheters in the heart with multiple bipoles being recorded and displayed at once. And again, for the less experienced viewer, I'm going to simplify and eliminate most of these electrogram channels because they are not necessary to make the point for this slide. Let's focus on the His bundle recording specifically, and I'll label for you the atrial, the His bundle, and the ventricular electrograms in those electrode pairs. There are two main features that you should notice during this A1, A2 programmed stimulation maneuver. The first is the difference in the QRS appearance between the first and the second beats on the page. After the A1 beats, the QRS is relatively narrow, but after the A2 beat, it's extremely wide. The second interesting finding to note is that there is a His bundle deflection between the atrial and the ventricular electrograms on the A1 beats but there's no such his deflection on the A2 beat. 
So the question is, how do we explain these findings? The answer is that there is an accessory pathway present. And if you look carefully now in retrospect, we'll see there's a little delta wave here on the surface EKG on the A1 beat. And this QRS represents a blend between conduction in the forward direction over the accessory pathway, which explains the little initial delta wave deflection, and conduction down the AV node in his Purkinje system, which is responsible for generating a relatively skinny rest of the QRS complex. However, when we deliver an A2 beat that comes in early enough, we're bombarding the AV node and either the AV node decrements to a large degree, whereas the accessory pathway does not, or we may have even blocked in the AV node because we have surpassed the refractory period of the AV node. In either case, there's no evidence that we got through the AV node and to the His bundle in time to contribute to the QRS complex, which instead is generated exclusively over the accessory pathway, which doesn't at all mind having been bombarded by an early A2 beat because the accessory pathway does not have decremental properties. So here we have demonstrated with A1, A2 programmed stimulation pacing, the behavior of the AV node versus an accessory pathway that's conducting in the forward direction. Here is an example showing ventricular program stimulation with another subtlety that I wanted to highlight. Here are the V1 and V2 beats. And if we look here at retrograde atrial activation, we'll see a different pattern than anything we've seen before. We've talked about an eccentric activation versus a concentric activation of the coronary sinus, meaning earliest at 1-2 versus earliest at 9-10. But here on the V1 beats, we see a blend of those two, a reverse C-shape, where there's early activation both out at CS1-2 and at CS9-10. The reason for this is during retrograde conduction on those V1 beats, the signal is passing upward both through an accessory pathway that is beyond CS12 and also through the AV node at the interatrial septum. So the electrograms that we record in the coronary sinus catheter are a blend of those two ways that signals are getting from ventricles to atria. But what about on the V2 beat where we now have an eccentric only activation? Well, what happened on that beat is we have decrement in the AV node in the retrograde direction or possibly even block in the AV node in the retrograde direction. So we don't have any early activation of the septum and CS910, but we exclusively have retrograde activation via the left lateral accessory pathway showing early signals out in CS12 and then traveling in a left to right fashion across the floor of the left atrium and the coronary sinus consistent with only conduction over a left lateral accessory pathway. Another way that we can use programmed extra stimulation to show us how the ventricles connect to the atria and we can stress those connections in particular the AV node by putting in early extra beats. We have previously discussed that one of the reasons that we perform programmed stimulation during an EP study is trying to induce reentrant arrhythmias. Programmed stimulation can induce a circuit to perpetuate because of a certain principle called unidirectional block. When you have a circuit, that implies that you have two routes of getting from point A to point B in a chamber. And if you put in early extra beats, you hopefully will find a window of time with the early beat that one of the two limbs of the circuit is recovered from the previous beat and the other limb is not, it's refractory. In which case, the signal you deliver 
early, will travel down only one of the two routes, get to the far end of the circuit, and travel backwards up the other. And if the tissue recovers by the time that all happens, then you can have the signal travel a second time around the circuit and ongoing. Again, the principle is unidirectional block, and we'll talk about this in a future module. Here's an example of ventricular program stimulation inducing reentrant ventricular tachycardia. This is in the context of a patient who has ventricular scar with live myocardial fibers interspersed with scar tissue, and there is a potential circuit that can conduct round and round if we put in an early beat at just the right moment to get unidirectional block and start this circuit going. On this slide, we have exactly the same principle of unidirectional block and reentry being provoked by programmed stimulation, but now we have atrial programmed stimulation and we have supraventricular tachycardia as a consequence of a reentry circuit. I'm going to walk you through this busy slide by coloring all the atrial electrograms green and the ventricular electrograms and surface QRS complexes purple. Here are the A1 and A2 beats, and notice that the A1 beats have a pretty normal AV conduction time and normal AH interval, as I'll show in a moment, whereas the A2 early beat takes a really long time to get from atrium to ventricle. The reason here is that the circuit for this SVT is all within the AV node, and the two limbs of the circuit are a fast part of the AV node and a slow part of the AV node. That A2 beat blocked in unidirectional fashion. It blocked in the fast pathway part and conducted taking a long time to do so over the slow part of the AV node. And then it was able to conduct backwards up the fast, getting reentry going and initiating SVT. Again, we'll discuss this principle of reentry in a future module, but I wanted to highlight the fact that reentry can be produced with programmed stimulation in any part of the heart, and that includes for ventricular tachycardia, that's reentrant, for SVT, that's reentrant, for atrial flutter, which is reentrant. It's an important concept in electrophysiology and arrhythmia understanding.